And from that initial encounter, I avidly became a student. I appreciatively learned thereby to usefully apply gay liberation thinking to basic psychotherapeutic concerns, to gain a gay affirmative or even gay-centered perspective about psychology. And in so doing, I came to comprehend homosexual personality development in more respectfully mirroring terms of ably achieving a healthy gay identity and accordingly actualizing a qualitatively legitimate life of salubriously evolving selfhood integrally on a foundational and corporative basis. A modern humanistic view, like that expressed by Carl Rogers' book on becoming a person, now appropriately concerned with and justifiably applied specifically to the essential moral dignity, valuational esteem, and creative fulfillment of the modern same-sex loving individual as an authentically worthy adult sexual and social being in freely chosen affiliative association with like-minded others. Indeed, my own life exuberantly and delightedly now blossomed anew in the more sagaciously incisive context of this novel comprehensional view, as I committedly worked under its facilitative guidance to more so claim and feel my body, sexuality, feelings, and sense of selfhood, while I professionally trained to become a practicing psychologist and continued my rewarding gay activism. I wrote a master's thesis based on this regardful humanistic approach to homosexual people that eventually became Men Loving Men, a Gay Sex Guide and Consciousness book. Now I was a progressively emerging gay therapist and writer as well, and I even fell in love again for the third time, finally in a sincerely requited relationship of joyously fulfilling mutual intimacy. It seemed to me satisfaction that here I had at last really arrived a truly better understanding of myself and the bigger meaning of my same-sex love, or at the very least, an admirable start there too, which promised a subsequent lifetime of amply fruitful progress and its more comprehensive unfolding. And however, when I was 23 years old, a surprise dual catastrophe fatally struck at this foretellingly happy picture in the fall of 1974, my graduate school informed me that my almost completed thesis would now be completely unacceptable due to an enhanced and detailed promotion of gay sexual fulfillment. I would have to write an entirely new thesis if I wanted to graduate. And then, seemingly coincidentally, my lover conflictedly abandoned our relationship to residentially return to his needy wife and two young children. I was plunged affectively into a deep cyanic sea of paralyzing confusion and bleak despair. In this foully despondent mood, I became increasingly obsessed with what my lover meant to me, that I felt so amazingly hurt and yearning over his loss. Although I ruminated, on a broad variety of interpretive psychological comprehensions as well as just plain stock notions. None of the many answers I came up with felt like it really explained things at all fully for me, or in any serious way satisfyingly calmed my stricken heart. And one evening, I was aimlessly alone watching television in this grimly discontented mood when I incidentally noticed they were showing a new version of the Frankenstein story. As I watched the tall, handsome young doctor electrifying his entirely bandage-clad creation, I noticeably started to get caught up in the old tale's basic magic and human drama. After he then turned off the juice, Frankenstein slowly stepped up to the now breathing, mummy-like figure and carefully started to unroll its long, cloth bag. I was imaginatively wondering what sort of variant makeup engineered monstrosity would likely emerge from this supposedly tension building little procedure. When, to my growing astonishment, the gradually unfolding bandage advancingly revealed at first a very winning, boyishly handsome face, and then, as the wrapping kept going, a practically naked, lusciously hunky, reasonably muscular body. 
finally, when the so-called monster hesitantly opened his beautiful brown eyes and sweetly smiled with such a touching look of innocent longing for simple love and compassionate acceptance, my own filled heart startlingly went into a bombshell meltdown at this confoundingly unexpected outcome, and I abruptly, right then, amazedly experienced an inexplicable apotheosis. The despisedly hideous creature I had completely expected instead dumbfoundingly stood winsomely revealed as himself a glowingly inviting angel man, a libidinal seraph of the heavenly Lord in gorgeous mortal form, a most powerful tantric instrument of effective embodying spiritual initiation. Later, I read that the teleplay for this version of Frankenstein had been written by Christopher Isherwood and his lover, Don Bacardi. Suddenly, in a sublime emotional uprush, I felt all my own ugly pain and monstrous shame and the hurtful loss of my romantic relationship miraculously turn into their feeling opposites. And further, with a ravishing scope of resplendent human meaning way beyond absolutely anything I could ever have possibly visualized before, and I now saw with an oddly piercing clarity that intrinsically, within the encompassing erotic romantic love, I felt for my departed companion and all the others prior to him, whether gained or lost, their gloriously inhabited excessively a perpetually enthralling experience of absolute awe and staggering wonder, of restorative magic, beatific spirit, sublime wholeness, and elevating transcendence, only potentiatedly waiting just to be so feelingly discovered imaginatively and responsively explored passionately. A landmark evaluational experience about myself as personally homosexual of that distinctively revealing type which, if even once tasted, will immediately be appreciably seen to be absolutely beyond all compare, and which could therefore in commendably estimable consequence be no less appraisingly affirming than if it overtly described intimate redemptive encounter with the ever-renewing presence of eternally illuminating God, or as I would soon discover in Jungian terms, the archetype of the self in the evolutionary service of the maturational individuation process. In honest truth, the very soul of my own life has actually always been intently spent in rapt devotion to this radiant God of beautifully enlightening love. Now I saw, Canis itself was the sublime door to a still much better psychological understanding of my estimable homosexual personhood and its goodly qualitative possibilities, vastly far past everything I have already rewardingly discovered and productively become up till then. On that pivotal day of elevatory, earth-shaking revelation, I astonishingly met what seemed to be an inner autonomous intelligence, perhaps configuratively akin to what ancient Egyptians called the spiritual witness of the heart. And from then on, he increasingly became a subjective guide and friend and teacher for me. He became the topic of a new master's thesis, as one way I could then honor and more so understand him, and this founding awakened connection to me within the felt beingness of my ongoing homosexual experience, a thesis whereby I interpretively explored the underlying symbolism of that epic motif I and all the other gay men I knew were so fascinated by and caught up with the defining motivic theme of same-sex romantic love involvingly realized through mutual adult companionship with another caring man, in translational terms of the basic Jungian comprehension of genital love as being about the psychological soul, meaning the interior source of felt aliveness and inspiration, especially erotically personified terms of which, if I consider the modern concept of reciprocal homosexuality at the most elemental level of sexual symbolism to refer to a genital pairing of like with like, 
suggested the apt metaphor of an erotic archetypal twin, or double, to one's own biological sex as the projectively sought for wonderful companion, an alternative characterization of felt, soul, relationship, directionally operative in the subjective world of material dynamic relations to that of a female sexed figure in the amatorily patterning form of a primordially phallic reflection soul, a resonantly personal starting symbolism, which I could then additionally amplify through various myths and tales of same-sex love, both ancient and modern, that analogously show this reflective thematic pattern, such as found in Homer's Iliad, Plato's Symposium, the Old Testament, the Epic Gilgamesh, Frankenstein, the Secret Sharer, the Lord of the Rings, as well as many others. I then worked part of this exploratory analysis into a short paper, The Double, an Archetypal Configuration, which was published in the journal Spring, 1976. To my knowledge, this study was the first to ever appear in the Jungian literature by an out gay writer, and the first to openly espouse a homosexual archetypal point of view, as psychodynamically providing a reasonable developmental basis for healthy gay love and salutary personality formation. At the time of my overwhelming revelatory encounter, I instinctively sensed that to usefully understand it as a vividly compelling psychic experience conceptually required a Jungian theoretical framework, since, even though I knew of it only vaguely to that point, Jung's thought was the only systematized approach to human psychology I was even remotely aware of, which realistically offered to treat the fundamentally numinous and stellar qualities of what I was subjectively going through ideologically in anything like a sufficiently respectful and sustained way, rather than through reification reduction, substitution, or other forms of what now seemed intellectually to me like hostile ideational manipulation or trivializing superficiality. <coughs> Therefore, I eagerly turned to Jungian psychology and soon enough found that, while its hefty depth and deep hearingly satisfied what felt most important about the moral and spiritual gravity of my new personal revelations, its simultaneous homophobic devaluing of gays and its exclusively heterosexual concept of a man's soul image, the alluring female anima, left me cold. <laughs> but then it felt from my new gay center perspective that by now positing a masculine complement in a man's psyche to the female anima, in order to account for the marvelousness of my exaltational experience as constituently involving something necessarily on a qualitative human par with heterosexual romantic love as traditionally analyzed, yet not at all adequately enough described morally by any standard union concepts of gendered archetypes and relations, I could then easily enough picture the practical development of a compelling homosexual soul figure complex on such a phallically personifying basis as being symbolically behind the waxing value I and other gay men intoxicationally felt about same-sex romance as being of a reciprocally interested nature, distinctively different in various featured dimensions from analogous love for a woman, yet similarly personally gender-oriented, and such was just as ethically profound and spiritually full of treasurable valuational portent in its own relational way for our benevolent substantiating progress toward satisfactionally reaching a healthy psychological maturity as a determinative erotic love self-referentially for the same sexual gender interactively on the most richly human and ethically humanizing scale of sincere mutual intimacy and commendable subjective growth as an ultimately mystical and initiatory object love of and by the masculine sex that also includes its own symbolic form of adequately experiencing and wholesomely incorporating the psychic feminine as well. And thus so, as comprehensively involving in its own justifiable right that key actualizational process of integrational psychological advancement Jung calls subjective individuation.